Before we begin, I want to let you know about an upcoming program. Our 2019 Founders Day Symposium, Root Awakenings, with Jungian analysts Anne Belford Ulanoff, Mary Wells Barron, Donald McDevitt. It will be on Saturday, March 30th, 2019, at Fourth Presbyterian Church in downtown Chicago. For more information about that program, visit our website, youngchicago.org. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, analytical psychology seminars from the archives of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Breaking the Code of the Archetypal Self, an introductory overview of the research discoveries leading to neo-Jungian structural psychoanalysis, with Robert Moore, Ph.D. This lecture is the first part of the series Structural Psychoanalysis and Integrative Psychotherapy, an introduction to a neo-Jungian paradigm, which contains the following lectures, Breaking the Code of the Archetypal Self, Deep Structures and the War of the Psychological Systems, Structural Diagnosis, a neo-Jungian approach to understanding psychopathology, Toward a Structural Cure in Integrative Psychotherapy, and The Necessary Partnership between Integrative Psychotherapy and Integrative Spirituality. For regular listeners of this podcast, you'll be familiar with Robert Moore's bio, which is available in the show notes and also on our website. We'll also have links to the complete series, as well as links to all of Dr. Moore's lectures. For those of you wondering how you can support this podcast, instead of making a donation, find something in our online store that you're interested in and make a purchase. The revenue from our online store supports this podcast, as well as our in-person programs and the maintenance of a Jungian Institute in Chicago. You can also become a member of the Institute, which provides a few benefits, including 20% off all downloads and in-person programs, as well as invitations to our annual holiday party and other events. So now here's the lecture. Welcome to all of you. And as a personal word, I just want to thank you for, for, uh, giving me an opportunity to, uh, to begin trying to put um, this, uh, this theory, which I call structural psychoanalysis, to, uh, to make it very clear. Uh, we'll see in a little bit why I chose that. Uh, it, it is certainly neo, it's certainly a neo-Jungian point of view, and I'll say something about why I would, would designate it as neo-Jungian. Uh, but I intend for us to, to try to understand that what my goal is to try to move us past uh, these tribal uh, cultic uh, uh, traditions in psychoanalysis to some new places where we can actually honor each other more, try to learn from each other more, and try to learn from other sources more so that we can do a better job of trying to help our people that are our charge. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, there's uh, some material on my my journey, uh, uh, which I don't have time to get into right now. Perhaps later we can talk about that. <clears throat> uh, I have had uh, probably more analysis and psychotherapy than any other living person, and uh, from different schools of thought. Uh, I don't regret it. There was a, there's been a lot of work to do, and I'm still like you, uh, trying to optimize my integration. And uh, my wife and friends will tell you that there's still a ways to go. So I shouldn't get bored at this point in my life, right? Uh, so in any case, uh, but I'll just say at the outset, uh, for uh, uh, in, in the summer of 1965, a young professor, I want to honor him. I, I honor him in the foreword uh, in the preface to this new book, Facing the Dragon, that's just coming out. Um, young professor by the name of Frank Bacchus, 
who was the University of Chicago PhD. Uh, I was in Dallas at the time studying at Southern Methodist University and I took this course with Frank as a young pup wet behind the ears in my early 20s. And, uh, and Frank <coughs> lifted up this vision, this integrative vision of how you could take theoretical biology, systems theory, Jungian psychology, and Whiteheadian philosophy and and try to actually see things whole. And it was like somebody had popped LSD in my coffee. I mean, <laughs> blew my mind as a young pup, and, uh, and I've been pursuing that ever since. And, uh, and, uh, and it's taken a long time, <laughs> and a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, uh, money. Uh, but I haven't ever regretted it. And that's what the fruition of this, I really owe to Frank Bacchus uh, in 1965 because he sh showed me a vision and, uh, and I've been uh, working on it. Over the years I have not only had Freudian analyses, uh, my first book was a Freudian book. Uh, I have, uh, I have uh, done extensive work, as, I've, as you know, with Adler. Uh, at Larian work. At that time there wasn't any accessibility to Jung uh, in Chicago. And then later I did uh, Jungian training. Um, and uh, so I say to people, well I'm a Jungian not because I don't know anything else. I'm a Jungian by choice because I think it is the only psychology that has the potential of being large enough to really hold the human with respect. And, uh, and that does not mean I do not appreciate the contributions of other folks who have focused on much more regional concerns in psychology or, or research because they all have a place. But uh, uh, so over the years, uh, and I and uh, Catherine and I were comparing notes last night about all the different uh, all the different folks that we've let mess with our minds over the years, and uh, and we can compare notes on that, you know. But uh, but. Uh, uh, I had an intellectual interest in comparative theories back in 65, and, and that has never stopped. I've taught comparative philosophy at the university level, comparative spiritual traditions, comparative psychotherapies, comparative psychoanalytic theories, uh, uh, comparative mythology, uh, uh, all these years. And, uh, and so what I'm trying to offer you is is some of the fruits of that before I die. Uh, because some of you know that at my age, you begin to be very aware that time is limited. And if you're gonna make your, your offering, you need to make it. So hence this weekend, and hopefully, uh, as our Islamic friends say, inshallah, uh, God willing, uh, uh, for a while longer here. So I can, uh, so I can, uh, uh, offer what I've learned. So in any case, uh, I've had an intellectual interest in all these things, but it's also been uh, personal interest. Again, we can uh, compare notes about the various way we were shaped. I'll have an opportunity to do that to give an example of my, my, the way my theory applies to me, and you can think about how it applies to you. Uh, but in any case, uh, so this has been an existential quest as well. Uh, and uh, so let me, what I want to do is very fast uh, take us through what I, I think is the journey up to where I believe we are today and need to be facing uh, the challenge uh, of, of an adequate theory for integrative psychotherapy. Uh, and I say facing the challenge because, uh, you know, there's, there is, uh, there's a lot of theory out there and uh, a lot of people are afraid of it because it is such a thick morass, you know, it's such a, it's such a, a swamp, you know, like one of those Louisiana swamps. Uh, but, uh, but I'm one of these persons that believes that you've got to face the fact that all therapy is heavily theory-laden. And I learned from Tillich many years ago that you may not think your therapy is theory-laden, you may not have studied enough to know what theory is implicit in your actual practice, but 
in truth, there is either an implicit or explicit theoretical framework behind all uh, uh, practices uh, in therapy. And sometimes the, the overt framework relates to what is actually done, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the implicit theory uh, and a set of assumptions, as Adler would say, the assumptive world, is, is very unconscious to the healer. Now this does not mean that the healer can't do a good job because a lot of being a good healer, a, 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 uh, uh, a practitioner of what I like to call, I think we're all practitioners of street magic to the extent that we're any good. That is to say, this is not merely some academic enterprise to us. We're down there, we're down there wrestling with uh, the forces of death that try to destroy people and, and uh, in the course of it try to destroy us. Welcome. Tell us, your, tell us your name. I got lost. I'm Nyla. Nyla, welcome. We'll get and learn more about you later. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in any case, uh, so I want to just uh, walk us through quickly uh, through uh, some of the assumptive world uh, that leads us to be here to, to be here today. And uh, uh, another in another setting, uh, we'll have more time to discuss this. But but what I want you to get, I'm just looking at these these three pioneers of psychoanalytic uh, theory, uh, is to focus on the, the importance of the different theories of the unconscious and how they actually viewed what they did, how they looked at it, the influence upon, of their theoretical assumptions upon the way they looked at dreams. Some of you talked about dream, dream work. Uh, uh, it, when a dream does not interpret itself. Uh, 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 some Hillmanian fantasies to the contrary. Uh, a dream does not provide a theory for its own interpretation. And when somebody approaches a dream and begins to try to unpack a dream, there will be tremendous assumptions uh, about, uh, about the psyche and about the plumbing, I like to say, underneath the imagination. There are people today uh, in the academic world and in uh, very, very smart people, otherwise very smart people, who, who, uh, who think that you can have the imagine, you can have a sophisticated theory of the I mean, approach the imagination without understanding a plumbing that undergirds it. To me, that's intellectually bogus. Uh, uh, the imagination, uh, uh, as Jung argued, sits on a two million year old self. And, uh, and so you can have different theories about the plumbing, but uh, not to address the plumbing is, in my view, an intellectual cop-out. And if you try to tell students, including psychology students, graduate level psychology students, or, gra or postgraduate analytical candidates, that the imagination interprets itself without benefit of plumbing, uh, to me, that is intellectual sort of charlatanry. Uh, but anyway, so we, we, uh, you, 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 many of you could teach in a sophisticated course on Freud. And, uh, um, you know, there are many things one can emphasize, but, you know, Freud thought that uh, uh, the unconscious was very primal, very powerful, uh, uh, chaotic in its uh, energy and effects, pressing from within very heavily on individuals, pressing very heavily from within on individuals. So the primary model of Freud's understanding of the psyche, the classical view, which got tweaked a lot and fiddled with and changed a lot uh, uh, later, but the very primal view is that the it is hugely powerful and it's terribly difficult to regulate for human beings. And human beings engage in all sorts of self-deception as they attempt to struggle with the implications of having this thing in them. And, and so 
Ego defenses, all the theory we've had of ego defenses, all of the understanding of uh, repression, all of those things were predicated on a view that the it is pressing in a way that makes people so anxious they want to die if they can't have adequate defense mechanisms. I mean, that is a fundamental classical Freudian vision. As you will see later, <clears throat> I've come to appreciate Freud more about this uh, in recent years, because there are certain ways in which I think he was right. In any case, though, you, in Freud, you do not look to the unconscious for ordering, for real ordering. You don't look to the unconscious for real ordering. His theory, and this is important, and I'm going to use this to, to differentiate between theories. His theory is a chaos, order, chaos theory in that sequence. Chaos, order, chaos. That is the fundamental substrate. In other words, his implicit ontology, we would say in doctoral courses, his implicit theory of being is that being is fundamentally chaotic and that any order you achieve, whether it's civilizational order or personal order, is a tenuous achievement and soon to be undone. You see, I mean, that's why, that's why, he, had, that's why he took cocaine, you know? I mean, to help him with that. Uh, views of uh, being, in other words, are psychologically significant. And uh, in any case, though, there is no structure in the sense of a Jungian perspective to the deep, un archaic unconscious. It is a huge cauldron of energy. And although Freud intuited and, and in his earliest work uh, discussed structures that I would argue are, are talking about the collective unconscious, he did not go that route. It was too close to what Jung. He did not, he did not amplify that. But there is a sense in which even his theory of incest and his uh, theory of the Oedipal conflict is really a, an attempt to address the collective unconscious. But he never admitted it, and his, his uh, successors have never, ever even gone anywhere near there. They didn't go as near there as Freud did. So uh, uh, some other, in some other seminar, I'll teach that material in, in much greater depth. But what I want you to get is you don't look to the unconscious for guidance. You simply face what you're dealing with. Uh, he could have written this book, Facing the Dragon, because there's something that from his point of view, trying to eat you, and uh, and you better you better wake up and face it. Uh, so when he came at dreams, I'll just use dream interpretation as the as the modeling. When he came at dreams, <clears throat> for Freud, dreams lied. It it was their job to lie. And the psychic mechanism uh, of the unconscious. To the extent that your unconscious mechanisms enabled you to lie, that was how well you could deal with your anxiety. Because if the, if the mechanisms in the psyche were not able effectively, this is why the idea of defense mechanism, if, you're in, if your psychic uh, machinery was not able adequately to defend against knowing what is going on in the psyche, your anxiety level goes up. And so you could say, to the extent that the psyche is unable to n not know, it gets more anxious and dysfunctional. So in other words, that repression barrier, <laughs> it's, it's your bulwark. And then hopefully if you get more materialist personality, you'll be able to, to, your defenses will be strong enough that you can gradually begin to let some of that primitive energy in 
in a creative way to fuel your lo loving and working, right? Are you with me on that? The important thing is, though, when you're looking at a dream, you're trying to decode that dream to figure out how it's lying. You're not really, if you're a classical Freudian, you're not looking to that dream for guidance about what to do with this personality, except in the sense that you can get clues in that dream about the particular shape of their lying and the places where they're failing to be able to lie well enough. And so the truth is sneaking through and creating symptoms. Um, a, a paraphrasis, you know what, a slip of the tongue? A paraphrasis is when the truth begins to slip through the sphincters of the psyche. That's what that is. Uh, are you with me on that? Okay. Now, Adler. Freud accused Adler of being an ego psychologist. In fact, Adler was really probably the first ego psychologist. Uh, it is as true to say that, for example, Eric Erickson in his work are neo-Adlerian as it is to say that Eric Erickson's work is neo-Freudian. Uh, because uh, the, the reason there was so much tension between Freud and Adler was that Adler put so much uh, emphasis on the creative adaptive uh, dimensions of the psychic organism and not the defensive dimensions, but the creative adaptive dimensions. The attempt of the psyche in Adler to face its situation, it's a social world for Adler. It's not, it's not so intrapsychic. It's a social world. The organism opens its eyes. It sees a terrain. It draws cognitive. Adler was the, the original cognitive psychologist. I wish back in some of these people would honor their heritage, you know, instead of thinking they invented this. Uh, but he was the original cognitive psychologist. I draw conclusions based on my situation in the birth order in the family and in the family constellation. And I draw and I extrapolate a set of very exaggerated assumptions about self, world, sex, others, my place, uh, my future, uh, in, in order to adapt, I must blank. Uh, and so uh, when an Adlerian is looking at you, uh, they're going to study you intensively initially because an Adlerian analyst will intend to understand you clearly in the first probably 10 sessions. And what they're going to go for is a what I would call, you know, because I'm paying attention to structures, a structural analysis of your assumptive world. They're going to look at the structure of your assumptive world. And they're going to get your early recollections, and they're going to get your birth order, and they're going to look really intently early at your family constellation. And they are going to figure out what your assumptions are. And those assumptions, from their point of view, are, are going to be present everywhere in your life. All of your behavior makes sense. It's rational behavior. All of your behavior, according to an Adlerian, is very much like Albert Ellis is an Adlerian. He just is a good franchiser. He doesn't admit it. <laughs> you know, it's, you know uh, ripping off Adler has been a very uh, uh, popular profession in uh, recent dynamic psychologies. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, so, <clears throat> so he's going to figure out what your structure of your assumptions are, and those things are going to be everywhere, and, and everything you try to do to adapt is going to reflect those assumptions. So what is, uncon what is the unconscious for Adler? There is no the unconscious. It is you are unconscious. About what? about what you, your most fundamental beliefs are. Your, your individual philosophy, your private logic. And you do not understand your private logic. It's not that, it's, it's not that you're not a rational person. 
and doing a rational thing, but for Adler, uh, you take the premises that you learned before you were 10, probably before you were eight, probably earlier, uh, and then everything follows from those assumptions. And so if a, an Adlerian analyst then is going to get about trying to help you become aware of what those assumptions are and to help you become, as we would say today, critical about those assumptions. And to gain, what is the freedom you get from an Adlerian? We can talk about all the freedom you get from an Adlerian is freedom to, to, to reflect upon your um, primal assumptions and to decide that you don't want to keep on assuming it if it doesn't work anymore. If it's not, it was right when you were six, but uh, you are not six years old anymore. You're not as weak and vulnerable as you were when you were six years old. And so it's time to update your assumptions based on new data, sort of like science. Uh, uh, so if you look at a dream, now an Adlerian therapist may look at a dream, but what will they be looking at the dream for? Somebody tell me, based on what I just told you. They're going to be looking for the, the beliefs, the beliefs that you have. And, if, and they're going to feel, that therapist is going to feel that if they did a good job in the first 10 sessions, they already know what they is, those are. And so it's not that they're not going to pay attention to the dream because any decent Adlerian analyst is going to know they may be wrong about what they decided heuristically in the first 10 sessions. So they're going to always be watching to check the, their hypothesis against emerging clinical data. So the dream serves an Adlerian not to guide them in the sense of any kind of transcendent function that we'll be talking about in classical Jung. <clears throat> The dream is not hiding anything as it attempted to do in the Freudian psyche. It's revealing, not hiding. But what is it revealing? Are you with me? Anybody not with me so far? It's, it's revealing the same thing as your early memories should have revealed. It's revealing the same thing that your place in the family constellation should have revealed. So you look at the dream, not for guidance, but for confirmation of your diagnoses. You follow me? Because if that dream shows assumptive structures that are not parallel or isomorphic with your diagnostic declension, you got to go back to your diagnostic declension and revise it. Because there's a rule. The fantasy materials, here's the fundamental Adlerian assumption, the fantasy materials in the psyche, all of them, all of them, whether it's a daydream, a memory, a dream, All of them will reflect the lifestyle assumptions. So, so you see the difference there? You're, you, the un, there? There's no place called the unconscious. But there's certainly unconsciousness. And it is the task of the analyst uh, to, uh, to engage aiding the analyzand to start understanding it's it's understand understanding why their attempts at adaptation are failing so that they can act differently so they can choose different behaviors to think differently about their goals and so forth in life anybody doesn't get that see that now, now this, in this same Corsini book, if you haven't ever 
run on that book by Raymond, that, that edited anthology by Raymond Corsini. I think it has, it's the best single anthology comparing theories I've ever seen. Because all too often when you get a book comparing theories, it's written from the point of view of one theory. So you get a more or less adequate treatment of one theory, often less, uh, and, and you get a caricature of all the other theories. But what Corsini did was a lot more mature and cooperative as befits an Adlerian that he is. He came up with a set of questions. And he chose who, people that he believed to be the best people that he knew representing different schools of thought. And he asked them to write chapters based on these, answering these questions. And that book, Current Psychotherapies, and there's another one that he did, uh, I don't know whether it's still in print, I haven't heard about how he's, what he's up to, but it was co called Current Personality Theories. And, uh, and it's a fine comparative uh, analysis of comparative theory. And if you've never done that very much comparative theory, you probably ought to try to track, track down his books on that uh, because it's very rich and, and, and I've used... The first word, what kind of personality theories? Current. Current. And, of course, it's outdated now, but the method he uses is a very, very mature cooperative method, trying to get people, in fact, I intend, uh, hope that we can, in this institute, that we can actually uh, emulate Corsini. I fully intend to, to have us emulate uh, in terms of, of, of key issues in uh, contemporary psychoanalysis and inviting, you know, different uh, folks of the different contemporary streams to, to write essays on those theories, and hopefully we'll be able to find the money to publish anthologies, uh, which will which will be able to uh, uh, in a, uh, facilitate dialogue, which doesn't happen enough. Okay, so then we get to classical Jung. Uh, today, I'm just going to go once over very lightly here with classical Jung, uh, and I have included uh, as our resources for classical Jung, Jung himself, some of the modeling there, and, uh, and Edward Ettinger who I personally believe, you know, he died recently, in the last few years. Uh, in my view, Edinger uh, was sort of the, the uh, best representative of classical uh, Jungian analysis in terms of kind of trying to boil Jung down to, to uh, the sort of fundamental uh, Jungian assumptions and try to lift those things up. Uh, uh, there are a lot of classical Jungians but, uh, but Edinger's uh, work that we'll look at in a minute uh, captures And if you have not seen this latest posthumously published book, uh, Edinger's Science of the Soul, a Jungian perspective, it's a set of essays that <coughs> Daryl Sharp and Gary Sparks, two Jungian analysts, uh, brought together uh, of his theoretical lectures uh, Science of the Soul, Encounter with the Greater Personality, the Therapeutic Life, the Vocation of Depth Psychotherapy, and the Transference Phenomenon. It's the best thing that uh, for you folks at your level that there's ever been. And you can read this, and then you can then read. I recommend, and I'd love to teach a seminar just on the genius, uh, another one. I've taught some, and you can get some of my lectures from the Young Institute on the genius of Edward Edinger. Ego and Archetype, The Genius of Edward Edinger. But you will not go wrong immersing yourself in Edinger to get a feeling for what a classical, a real feeling for what a classical point of view is like. But let's, let's uh, go back to the grand old classic text from these diagrams. This is from Jacobi, Psychology of C.G. Jung. There are several diagrams here from Jacobi. Three different diagrams from Jacobi. The first one gives you a sense of this layering. Because in Jung, yes, you have an ego. Uh, you, yes, you have a personal unconscious, uh, which parallels the, the preoccupations that Freud and Adler had. In fact, as many of you know, 
Jung was heard to say many times, when I'm dealing with somebody in the first half of life, I use Freudian and Adlerian techniques. And we have to remember, not only Jung was a leading Freudian psychoanalyst, he didn't, he didn't, I mean, he had his own theory before he worked with Freud, but he, he deeply immersed himself in that Freudian material. And uh, they, they really expected him to be the heir apparent uh, until it became too politically problematic. Uh, in any case, uh, um, and it's not widely realized how much Adler influenced Jung. Uh, Jung uh, is at least as Adlerian as he is Freudian, and probably more. In fact, a lot of Jung's uh, understanding of the purposive nature of symptoms, uh, he, he derived from some of this interaction with Adler. Uh, in any case, but Jung adds but at least the conscious mind, the personal unconscious, he adds a realm of the collective unconscious. And Jacoby, in her fine, she's got three fine books you ought to all know by heart practically. Uh, the Psychology of C.G. Jung, uh, Complex Archetype and Symbol, and The Way of Individuation. And uh, in my view, it's probably the most competent a uh, careful explication of, uh, of early, early Jung. And that's why these di diagrams. So you see, you've got the central energy here the low, at the deepest level. Then you have the animal ancestors. Then you have the uh, primitive human ancestors. Then you have, as this, as the, as the, the deep, deepest thing, deepest aspects of the psyche start coming forward into individual expression. It's always coming through some ethnic group. Uh, and it comes up through, and, and, and when nation states form, it comes through nations, comes through tribes. So we would say today, my partner, uh, Margaret Shanahan, has done a lot of work on the cultural unconscious. Uh, I focus more on the collective unconscious. She's focused a lot more on the, on the cultural unconscious. But we would call this ethnic group nation, tribe, and we'd add today religion, um, religious tradition and so forth, uh, as elements of the cultural unconscious. Uh, then you have the family unconscious, the family system, you and I would say today, as it refracts this primal light coming up through the, uh, through the psyche. And then, um, then finally, the individual. And so every individual, according to this point of view, is, is uh, extremely complex integration, an extremely radically complex integration. And if there's anything I want to use as a primal metaphor uh, uh, or, or, or way of languaging what... what uh, what the psyche really is, the human psyche really is, must be, uh, and what individuation really is, it is creative organization of an incredibly complex, multidimensional uh, thing, being, organism. And one of the things, you know, you mentioned a while ago, some of you were mentioning about uh, what's happening in mental health, not only in theory but in practice. But uh, there sure are a lot of uh, otherwise smart people today that really want us to believe human beings are a lot more simple than they are. They're kind of dumbing, dumbing us down on behalf of the drug companies. You know, uh, 
let's don't think too well. Let's, let's, let's just assume that, that the most important dimensions of human life are these dimensions. And everything can be reduced to those dimensions. Uh, I'm surprised that anybody with any intellectual sophistication today after general systems theory could assert such a thing. But I'm always amazed at what otherwise smart people will assert. There's no doubt that uh, in my mind and the framework I want you to think about the psyche with and the self with is a system. <coughs> the, the human self is a system that participates in a enormous hierarchy of systems. And so there are microsystemic function levels of functioning and there are macrosystemic levels. And um, uh, integrative science today is laying that out <laughs> in an incredibly complex way. And so uh, so the the thing that makes Jungian theory today well, one of the many things that makes it attractive is that there is this fundamental sense in the primal vision of Jung, in the primal vision of Jung. He had such a sense of the complexity of this thing that we are. And uh, he was not into oversimplifying things, as you've noticed by reading his books. Uh, okay. Now, this other, this, this diagram. And we just spend a lot of time on these diagrams. I love these diagrams. Uh, and there's a bunch more diagrams that I'll love to share with you sometime. But, but these are ways to, uh, trying to help model these relationship between these different levels, these different functions, these different system functions in the psyche at different levels. And um, the struggle uh, later on this weekend, you know, uh, we'll try to really complexify matters to ask ourselves, what's persona got to do with, with systems theory? Because I guarantee you, it's got a lot to do with systems. It's got a lot to do with the attempt to differentiate from fusion in a system, if you, if you know what I mean. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, and very early in Jung's thought, he, because of his cross-cultural studies, which is comparative cross-cultural study of symbolic forms, is fundamentally, essentially Jungian. You cannot be a Jungian in any meaningful sense of the word and not understand the importance of the comparative study of symbolic forms. Now, why is that? Because Jung had the assumption that symbolic forms are the outer faces which deep, deep, hardwired patterns, you can call them instincts. Later on this weekend, I will call them biograms. Or we can call them archetypes, but primal patterns of the human organism turn a face to the world which is carried in a mythic image, a symbolic content, a symbolic image. And <clears throat> so one of the primal things that Jung did in his early work Jung was fascinated by the quaternio, the quadration of the world, the, the four quarters of the world. He called it, if you look in the 20th volume in the collected works and look under quaternio and look at the huge numbers of references to the quaternio, in his comparative studies. A quaternio is images of quadration 
in human cultural symbolic forms. Then if you know, we'll get later, uh, uh, later on, we'll get to uh, double quaternio. Because Jung noticed that in symbolic forms put forth by the human organism, wherever they exist, they will put out quadration and they will put out an eightfold thing. So they put out a fourfold image and they often put out an eightfold image. And so if you look in the collected works, I know those references to double quaternio, you will see his, what he's doing, he's scanning. He's got his computer on scan. And he's scanning for these patterns in mythic images. Okay? <clears throat> so Jung is, is watching for what he thinks is in the hardwiring. And then he's watching for what he thinks is influenced by cultural software. And he's looking for what's influenced by family software. Couldn't have known Adler without asking that. He's looking for software that was formed in the personal history of the individual. Uh, and he's trying to differentiate. He's trying to look and see what, what he can find out uh, by casting his scientific net as widely as possible. In other words, you've got to understand when Jung is looking at Hinduism or alchemy, he's not just being a crazy mystic. Although, you know, like me, he was a little bit of a crazy mystic. Uh, but just because you're a crazy mystic, that, that's not maybe the only thing you're doing with looking at these things. Because it, the scientist, when he had his scientist hat on us, which is what, what uh, is one of the hats that I think you need to wear, he was scanning for data everywhere. So he was an integrative, scientific, psychoanalytic thinker from the outset. He was scanning for a pattern, trying to come up with a theoretical understanding of why it exists the way it does. Okay, so these diagrams are some of the diagrams in which uh, Jung was trying to model the different levels of, of the uh, hardware and software as the psyche is trying to form a, an ego organization. And uh, complexes are, we would say today, centers of organization in the psyche. Some of you have studied object relations theory. Jung, in some ways, was the first object relations theorist mm -hmm. because he really, uh, by focusing on an autonomous complex, that is what an object is, an object relations theory. It is an internal representation that has all sorts of implications in all sorts of realms, perception, relationship, a relationality, all sorts of things, uh, and levels of internal organization of the personality system. All that stuff that the uh, Kleinians and the, uh, the Kernbergians and uh, et cetera, that all those traditions, all those things you can trace in the history of psychoanalysis back to Jung's theory of the complex, although they never do it. They never do it. But, uh, but just as contemporary theorist of multiple personality disorder, uh, uh, are ba doing badly a Jungian theory of the multiplicity in the psyche. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, the object relations traditions are simply picking up on a very sophisticated attention to certain levels, certain levels, you know, the magnification of the clinic clinical mind, 
there are a lot of settings of magnification in the microscope of the clinical mind. And we've got to remember that because none of these people are stupid. They know a lot. And, but they've got, their, they've got their lens set at different orders of magnification on different levels of system functioning. Yeah, you were going to say something. Yeah. 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 And when I pointed that out a couple years ago at the International Medical Association, I said, well, they have to have some sort of mechanism to do that. Yeah. 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 Why didn't you admit it? Why didn't you put a footnote in? Don't you understand what plagiarism is? <laughs> right, right. Now, that's what I'm talking about, tribalism. I mean, sort of a, a cultic, you know, I wrote a book on cults, psychology of cults. And, and uh, psychoanalysis has been really a cult phenomenon, really, for the most part, still is. Most psychology is, for that matter. I mean, what I'd call today tribal grandiosity, uh, uh, leading to an act, cognitive acting out. Uh, and just like all grandiose acting out, there's always truth in it, uh, which we'll get to later. There's always truth in your grandiose acting out. It's just that it's very unruly, <laughs> kicking you around. Okay. And one of the other things, though, you can peruse this if you haven't seen this before, but one of the other things I really love about this classical insight, that little diagram there on what a complex is and how it affects consciousness, how it intrudes into consciousness, I have come to believe, by a long roundabout route, that symptoms are archetypal aneurysms. Aneurysms. Aneur you know what an aneurysm is? It's when the, the membrane is not strong enough to contain a flow in an optimal way or even a good enough way. And when the wall of a flow vessel is not strong enough to contain that flow, this is a dangerous situation. I have come to believe that most folks are closer to being psychotic than we have ever really admitted except for some people like Harold Searles uh, and a few others. That is, that uh, here I am, again, I want to honor Freud because this is classical Freud. That is, the level of organization in your psyche is not as good as you think it is. That's my, that's where, I, hmm? Huh? It's very important to learn that. And the reason it's important to learn that is because if you don't learn that as a clinician, not to say as a person, if you don't learn that as a clinician, your level of empathy for your clients is going to not be what it needs to be. And you will not be as, shall we say, active in helping them find workable prostheses to stent their aneurysms first. So in other words, I'm going to say to you that the, the first thing as a therapist, we're getting ahead of myself here, but the first thing as a therapist you, that, that, that you've got to do is to be aware of how dangerous these aneurysms are to the structural integrity of the self-system. A little less self-system here. When I use self-system, I'm using little s, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But, but uh, Jung knew this, Edinger knew this, uh, Freud knew it, um, Adler had moved away from, he, he didn't get this anymore. And he saw a lot of stuff as, as, as real manipulation, which I think is desperate struggle for last-ditch 
organization attempt in the, in the psychic self-system. You follow me? So we're going to come back there later. But uh, in other words, the therapist on the front lines, as all of you are, has got to think, where are the aneurysms? How can I get about stinning them before I get into any grandiose fantasy of healing them and transforming them? It's like, this is why ritual is important. See, And we'll get more to that later tomorrow. But uh, uh, not that I, I believe people can be transformed. And I believe that your patients have enormous potential as human organisms. Potential that may or may not be realized, depending on how much aid they can get in resourcing the deployment of their archetypal potentials. And as you know, our situation is bad and worsening in how much resource we can get to people to help them evoke their potentials. What's happening in the mental health establishment now is that we are letting economics determine theory. <coughs> and and our, our understanding of, of how much better pe their prognosis is almost totally dominated by the bottom line. And I'm totally against that. Uh, I'm angry about what's happening, very angry about it. And uh, it's, it's an embarrassment to anybody that pretends to have any kind of ethical, uh, moral seriousness. Uh, but in any case, we'll get into that more later. But anyway, so peruse these diagrams. And now back to this other diagram on the classical. Jung struggled and struggled and struggled to try to figure out, now what is this, what is this quadration in the psyche? And he came to the idea of typology. And this is, uh, this is Jacobi's uh, uh, imaging of, uh, of, the, of the typological quadration. Uh, as we'll see in a little bit, Tony Wolfe didn't agree with him about what the quadration was. And uh, I suspect personally that that's one of the reasons they had a split. Uh, late, late split. When she published that uh, diagram that I'll show you later, uh, it was a break similar to F Jung's break with Freud. Tony Wolfe was going in a structural direction, I later found out, that uh, did not agree with Jung's uh, uh, decision about what is the quadration. But this is Jung's view of the quadration, what the quadration is in the psyche. Now let's stay with the classical view a little bit more here. There are three Edinger diagrams, only two of which I'm going to touch on. If you peruse this one, this is, has to do with, we can talk about that, uh, we can talk about this one uh, on uh, Sunday morning. So don't let me forget. This is about cultural vessels for archetypal transferences. Think religion, think spiritual practice. Think, 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 well, hopefully not just Sunday morning because uh, that is, that represents a very, very deteriorated uh, leaking vessel. Uh, but in any case, you would think Sunday morning. You would think Sunday morning. Uh, and in the, in the best congregations, where people really know what they're doing, they are doing their best to provide a vessel of transformation for their people and also a, a container for the energy in their community so we can get into that Sunday. But so let's come back to that. Uh, this is Edinger's diagram from Ego and Archetype where he is showing how early in life, and this is very Jungy, this is Jung, this is just Edinger's attempt to do what he seldom did, be a theoretician. Uh, Edinger, I like to say about Edinger, he teaches like a rabbi. Uh, and that's a good way to study Jung because if you don't do it like a rabbi does it, you're going to just completely be, you're probably going to give up. But the way rabbis study things, they take text, important text, and they, they take a, a text 
and then they circumambulate that text and they get a lot of smart people around and they reflect on the meanings, the multivalent meanings of that text. And, and incredible wisdom comes forth when a really gifted hermeneutical, uh, a hermeneut, a, a, a what I call a magus, a hierophant, uh, comes to a text. Now, when, when Edinger approaches the Jungian collected works, he is like a Jewish rabbi uh, approaching the Torah or the Talmud. And that's what you've got to know when you're reading Edinger. If you don't know that, you'll give up. And that's what you also ought to do. You ought to emulate him in reading Jung because, because you can't read Jung. Uh, you, can't, you can't do them as a theoretician uh, shooting up with that. Uh, it's totally, ca it'll make you crazy because it's so much. And it's not, they don't do the theoretical thing for you very, very much. We'll get into that more later. It's not really an integrated uh, out front theory. It's not extroverted. They're not, they're not telling you, I'm an extrovert. I'm going to get you to say what's what. You know, don't just keep your cards back there behind your vest. Okay, so as development occurs, that ego has to be grounded in the self. That's its foundation. What is the self? Think all of your archetypal potentials all the way down, all the way down. Today, we would even say all the way down to the primal physical energies of the universe. Yourself is your connection to all that. The archetypal capital S self, will you say. The ego, and to use my language, uses the codes in the self, sometimes okay, sometimes not so well, but it uses those codes to try to build the house of an ego, or as I, I consider myself a self-psychologist, very, I've been heavily influenced by Heinz Kohut, deeply indebted to him, my wife. Uh, as a scholar of uh, psychoanalytic self psychology, among other things, she taught me. She was uh, she studied a lot with uh, Ernest Wolf, who was Heinz Kohut's uh, uh, chief colleague, and so I have indebted to Margaret for teaching me the Kohutian stuff, and it's totally revolutionized revolutionized my way I think about Jungian material. Totally revolutionized it. I, I'll try to show you how I'm different from Kohut. I'll also try to show you later uh, how I'm. I think Kohut was revolutionary in his understanding of the little s self system and how the self is not the ego. You cannot equate the little s self system with the ego complex because it is not the same thing. And so, uh, so as we look at this classical model, though, they didn't have a theory of the little s self. And so what Edinger and Jung would try, and this really, uh, this really came from earlier theorists, the whole concept of the ego, ego self-axis, and then Edinger developed it, uh, is the, the capacity for the ego, to, the ego consciousness to emerge from the self in as, what I would like to say, creatively organized manner as possible. And that gives you a foundation for individuation. The emergence of the ego system, the ego complex, from the archetypal potential template of these archetypal givens, you can read that instinctual givens, you can read that uh, biograms, you can read that all sorts of ways from a reductionistic uh, biological perspective of which there's much evidence that I'm going to just point at later. But, but uh, the, the, there is this foundation there and, you're, and the ego is trying to form in an integrated way out of that potentia, potentia. And now Jung, now see, he knew how hard this was to have an ego 
actually begin to be able to differentiate from all this instinctual flooding. Is that like Freud? You bet. So these people that draw these neat little lines of division between Jung and Freud, they don't understand either one of them. Because, because the struggle to emerge into a functional consciousness that works from your instinctual substrates or archetypal substrates, primal substrates, I like to say 220,000 volt substrates, this is hugely difficult and mostly honored in the breach. That is, most people do not achieve very much, to, coin, to use one of Murray Bowen's phrases, differentiation. Because what are we talking about here? And we'll get to Bowen's theory tomorrow a little bit, just very briefly. We're talking about differentiation from fusion. So even though these Bowenians don't think their work relates to psychoanalysis of any kind, much less Jungian, they're wrong. Uh, this is differentiation. Uh, and tomorrow I'll talk about the differentiation scale in Bowenian theory, and then I'm just going to say, well, you can put right beside it a self-integration scale in psychoanalytic theory, and they are the same thing. They are simply two facets of the same thing in terms of the integration of the personality within its system. Okay? That's getting ahead of ourselves. But anyway, this is classical Jung. And uh, this is hugely difficult. And this diagram of Edinger's shows the struggle. <laughs> and Edinger was a little pessimistic, and for good reasons. But pe too pessimistic, but for good reasons. Uh, you, you start out in this ego self-identity where you're not sure where, you, where your archetypes start, a stop, and you start as a little less self-system or an ego. That's the condition of the people that walk in your office. They are being flooded with primal energy. Where do you start? Uh, at the top. You start from ego self-identity, which is what a child, a, a child is merged with, the, with their instinctual givens. There are a hundred theories that we could talk about that get that today. They're from the Freudian camp, from the neo-Freudian camp, from the, uh, from the self-psychology camp, uh, from the inner subjectivity camp, uh, you name it, but they all are getting that. Uh, that that there's a primal, there's a primal uh, 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 experience that has to be has to be experienced by the organism. It can't be screwed up by experience and trauma because that primal that primal experience can become very problematic very early. And we'll, we'll get into that. But in any case, one, as one differentiates, to use the Bowenian word, from the great self, I call it, there will come a point where it feels like alienation. And one's energy level starts to drop. Why? Because one of the other things you've got to get to understand classical Jung is the archetypal self is the source of all energy in the psyche. The ego does not have any energy of its own. The ego's energy is derivative from the archetypal self. And so when you're talking ego self axis, you're talking about the level of energy or to put it in more technical terms, arousal states in this organism that you're sitting in your office. That organism sitting in your office is 
experiencing certain levels of arousal and they're all over the place right from what you see right well if they're too merged in a primal way with the archetypal self they're frying in energy and it's causing them to act out all over the place they are not doing it from this point of view that person is not doing it they may think they're doing it to others their family members it may look like they are doing it but actually the archetypal self is doing it are you with me it's an intrusion but as they differentiate attempt to work on differentiating which is a long spiraling process you get into this place where your your connection with energy goes down and you feel alienated and you start feeling very instead of once earlier you felt like you were wonderful now you feel like you're nothing when your clients feel like they're absolutely nothing that their ego system is not experiencing a life-giving infusion of archetypal energy from the archetypal self does that mean the, the archetypal energy the archetypal self is gone from that personality absolutely not oh no it's not gone it's just up to no good in that personality uh, but the ego system that's sitting in your office talking to you that is from a Jungian point of view the conscious ego system if it's feeling depressed uh, or low energy or hopeless you know that the energy infusion that it that's that ego system is getting from the archetypal self is very tenuous very low that energy is going somewhere else it's going in symptoms other symptoms too other behaviors but anyway <clears throat> if it gets bad enough there will be a tremendous experience of dismemberment fragmentation we call it today uh, so you can get an experience of dismemberment from feeling alienated from the energy just like you can be blasted apart by merger with the energy and I want you to think system what do we know about natural systems we know that they have to have energy to sustain their system integrity that's a rule in all natural systems a scientifically established rule in all natural systems they have to have energy or they can't maintain their structural integrity that's true of your ego system it's true of uh, of uh, your personality in general it's actually true of your body in fact all the recent research uh, is really pointing to energy access and what's happening to energy energetics it's amazing how much energy has become the focus of medicine now the cutting edges of medicine <clears throat> okay so however if the ego system can differentiate from from the archetypal self consciously without assuming that the archetypal self no longer exists that is if the self is a vow if I'm not identified with it or if I'm not in the grandiose fantasy my ego's grandiose fantasy that that I am that it has died you know in other words the feeling of the dark night of the soul it's a grandiose fantasy a lot of spiritual types re, 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 language you know in the dark night of the soul this is such a spiritually significant experience well it is spiritually significant but it's grandiose as hell because it's the ego declaring the great self no longer exists I mean it's no longer present well that's one of our spiritual things we'll talk about Sunday morning the great self is present the ego can't handle that and so it it closes itself up uh, and uh, either makes an idol out of somebody else or it makes a, an idol out of its itself anyway but if there's repentance metanoia if there is the formation of the ego a conscious conscious ego self axis 
acknowledging the great presence and realizing how grandiose I have been, either in my merger or my de declaration that the great self is, doesn't exist. You follow that? The two sides of the grandiosity? Does anybody doesn't follow that? If you, if you are merged with the great self, you're a narcissistic personality disorder. If you feel that it really doesn't exist, you're a very, very depressive person on your last legs. Uh, both are arrogant. This is what the Cohusians didn't understand enough. They didn't understand how the varieties of grandiose expressions in the psyche. Most of my clinical uh, discoveries have been in the forms of grandiose, that grandiose energies take in the human psyche. They are not, they don't look alike, but they're all inflation. They're all aneurysms, in other words. Uh, so in any case, but if you repent, if you reconnect with the archetypal self, you know it's not, I, I know it's not me, I know that I'm not the archetypal self, then the energy flow immediately starts. The, the, the supply of energy starts again and the depression begins to lift. Now, of course, there's a danger, cyclothymic, right? You reconnect the energy and you don't have enough internalized structure. Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what? I can drink. I, I can drink. You know, I, I thought I couldn't drink, but, you know, I can drink. <laughs> Boy, can I drink. And, uh, and so then I get reconnected with the self. And, of course, this whole model here that he's got is a cyclothymic model. It's accurate in a lot of cases, but it's not all cases. Uh, but anyway, that's his... That's his uh, Model. It's wonderful stuff. I'd love to go into Edinger more with you. Uh, he does get it. He has such a sense of, of how tenuous the ego is in relationship to the great self and the psyche and how conscious you've got to be about forming that relationship if, you, if, if you're not going to get psychologically terminal. It's wonderful stuff. But now, Jung, Jung thought that quadration was, uh, was the typology, but he was a very smart guy, very intuitive, and he thought a lot about octahedrons. What the hell are those octahedrons? And if you look in the back of uh, the uh, series of four books, that uh, in the appendix to this, um, uh, which is where this comes from, and just look up in the collected works, all of his playing with octahedrons. Because he knew there was that eightfoldness and he, he couldn't figure out what the octahedral structure was, but he had an intuition that the archetypal self was shaped like an octahedron. He had an intuition that that was the case. And, uh, but he did not pursue it. It was one of, sort of became a cul-de-sac for him. He did not he, he worked with it, as you can see in the collected works. This is from the collected works. He, uh, he used a lot of Gnostic materials trying to sort out what it could possibly be, but he gave up on that. Uh, you what? Oh, it's, it's in, you can look in the, uh, in the reference in there. Uh, say, say it again. It's in the ion, yeah. Okay, now, the, uh, if you've ever seen the work of John Laird, this, uh, this uh, octahedral preoccupation has tried to return in the work of John Laird's book, The Celtic Quest, in which he tries to, to figure out how you put Jung's theory on the octahedral shape because he was following up this, this lead. This rabbit ran by in Jung's work, and Laird was trying to chase it. And this was, if you look at this diagram, uh, the Arthurian legend, the octahedral self, and look at John Laird's book, The Celtic Quest, this was a heroic effort to make sense out of the octahedron. Uh, I don't think it works, but 
but uh, but I admire the fact that he even noticed the importance of that octahedral coding in the in the archetypal self, and was trying to sort it out and also be very Jungian. Laird was being really a Jungian in his research method, because what he did was looked at the Mabinogi and the Irish epics for the patterns, and I'm going to get to that uh, uh, this afternoon about how right he was to look at that uh, as a source of data. But in any case, peruse this when you have time. Uh, the, uh, the line of thinking that, uh, that has led to my work uh, really follows that Tony Wolf line. So, so let us have the uh, Tony Wolf diagram. This was the thing she published in the, uh, the uh, Jung Club Bulletin. Uh, under uh, uh, the uh, structural forms of the feminine psyche. And she thought there were four structural forms that were the were an important quadra element of the quadration in the human psyche. From her point of view, there was the mother, the mother form, which, as you'll see in a minute, I think is really the queen archetype. There is the Amazon uh, structure in a woman's psyche. If you know my work at all, you know I think that's the female warrior archetype manifesting in the female personality. It's a lot more and a lot less pathological than the image of the Amazon. She said there's the hetera structure in the uh, in the woman in the structural form of the feminine, which you and I would say is the loving companion, the uh, this is the kind of woman every man wants to know intimately. She can make him feel like she would rather be absolutely nowhere else but to be with him, being his companion. You know, when we talk about anima projections, you know, for men, uh, a lot of the time you see the anima protection in the form of the hetera, especially in midlife males. You know, I mean, like, ooh, this woman doesn't have her own agenda. She just wants to have sex with me. That's all she cares about, just meeting my every need and listening to my every profound word. You know, my wife never listened to me but she does. And uh, so the companion, the, 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 this has got a lot of Aphrodite in it. This, is, this woman doesn't make a man feel like he's got to resource her castle. Think about it. Think about that. She just wants to go places with him, do things with him, right? Okay, and then there's the medial woman. That's what I call the lover, the female lover archetype in the, in the female personality. And then there is the medial woman. This is the woman, if you've ever been to a convention, a Jungian analyst, and you uh, uh, notice how the women dress, a lot of the time you'll see the medial woman archetype. The sort of uh, this, or you can go to a New Age convention uh, to the to the uh, area in the uh, place where they have all the readers. I'm not kidding you. And you can actually see the incarnation of this structure, the media woman. She dresses a certain way. She thinks about what she's doing in a certain way, and what she's doing is she's offering you a connection to the other world, to the archetypal world, the spiritual world, the meaningful world, the astrological world, the, the world beyond. And she's a priestess. Uh, and indeed, she may be that. There are a lot of incredible women that actually embody this in a pretty creative way. 
That's what I call the female magician, the archetype of the, fe the female magician, the archetype of the magician in the female personality, especially when it's very powerfully constellated. And uh, 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 if, you're a, uh, if you are a psychotherapist female interested in Jung, you got a lot of this in your personality. At least in, it's, 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 got a lot of, it's, it's got a lot of energy in your personality, in your system, in your ego system. And uh, so anyway, she's my mother in the, in the faith. Uh, I'll get into this afternoon uh, more about how I came to this declension and the details in it. But if you will look at this, uh, do you have the one, the... Uh, the uh, structural, I'm trying to find my own, the, uh, see, I've got it here somewhere. That's what happens when you got all, all these diagrams. Oh, here it is. This one here, the great code of the human self, a structural analysis. <clears throat> By the way, if you want to look at uh, Tony Wolf's diagrams, uh, and, and Edward Whitmont did a male version paralleling hers, and uh, Anthony Stevens in his book Ariadne's, uh, I think it's called Ariadne's, what's well, Ariadne? Is it Thread? Or it could be Ariadne's Clue, I don't know. But, but anyway, is Anthony, Anthony Stevens got Ariadne's Clue, I believe. Uh, you will see the diagrams of both male and female under the, the, the Tony Wolf uh, model. I didn't even know Whitmont had done that, but I want to honor him as my father in this kind of structural point of view. Uh, got Ariadne's Clue, I believe is the name, but it's got Ari it's, it's the only book by Anthony Stevens is going to have Ariadne in the title. What it is is a sort of an archetypal dictionary. Mm -hmm. Wonderful commentary articles on uh, various uh, archetypal images and so on. So... Uh, this, this is, uh, we'll come back to this, uh, what I have tried to do and what Anthony Stevens has tried to do is to not be a classical Jungian in the sense of using the collected works as the Black Bible, which you've got to uh, adhere to slavishly. But Anthony Stevens and I are both examples of what I believe is the direction we should be moving in uh, in Jungian work if you're serious about uh, uh, Jungian thought not being a cult and being really serious clinically. Uh, and that's what I call Neo-Jungian. And a Neo-Jungian, which is this that I'm presenting you is, what are the requirements for a Neo-Jungian as opposed to a classical Jungian or a post-Jungian. I'll rant about the, the so-called post-Jungians later, uh, Hillman and his crowd. Uh, uh, but in any case, it builds on Jung's key meta-theoretical foundations. That is to say, you cannot, if you're a neo-Jungian, you cannot do what Hillman and the so-called archetypal psychologists have done and throw out the idea of the archetypal self. If you throw out the idea of the archetypal self, in my view, you are no longer a Jungian. You cannot be a Jungian and have the word mean anything theoretically. You're really an Adlerian in my view, and I'll explain that to you in discussions later. But you're not Jungian because the, the, the objective psyche, the collective unconscious, the, the two-million-year-old self is a fundamental assumption of Jung's thought. And so, in order to be Jungian in any meaningful sense of the word, you've got to affirm that. Uh, uh, so the, the key metaphysical assumptions, which include fundamentally, and this is Edinger and Jung, the objective psyche. What does Jungian, specifically Jungian research, have to do? It's got to work on decoding the objective psyche. We've got a lot of smart people working on the personal unconscious. Very, very competently, I might add, at the complex level, at the level of complex. 
The Cahusians and the object relations theorists in many ways are superior to the Jungians at the micro level on complex. But in terms of the plumbing underneath complexes, they don't get it. But anyway, and so the second thing, a neo-Jungian theory, which I represent and which Anthony Stevens, I believe, represents, is you try to move the Jungian project forward. You don't, you don't try to leave it where it was at Jung's death. Uh, you try to move it forward by drawing on new evidence that Jung did not have. And that evidence, in order to be faithful to the Jungian project, has got to draw upon biological advances, advances in biological theory, not solely limited to neuroscience, but certainly including progress in neuroscience. It needs to draw, if it's not going to just be a cult, it needs to also try to figure out what its relationship is with research psychology of other schools to the extent that they are serious research scientific psychologists. It cannot be irrelevant to a inclusive integrative theory what the research psychologists are discovering about perception, about emotion, so forth and so on. Can't be irrelevant. Doesn't mean that you as a Jungian clinician need to spend a lot of your time learning all the niceties of the latest paper in per perception. But that, if you are serious, you are not going to depreciate the importance of learning more about the plumbing of perception because, because it's, a, it's all a, a, a great river, as the Hindus say. And third, a, a Jungian approach that is updated will have to continue doing what Jung did as science. That is, the science of comparative symbology. That is, the scientific study of comparative myth, mythical and symbolic forms. A, a scientific approach, not an antiquarian approach, not a New Age approach to symbolic forms, uh, not just a theological approach, although the theology has its place, which we'll talk about later, but a scientific attitude toward symbolic forms and what they tell us about the plumbing. And so any, any truly neo-Jungian point of view, which I'm trying to foster, and there's going to be a lot of resistance to this, as you might add, as you might think, as you might realize, is going to have to do those three things. Uh, or it's not trying to take the, 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 the method forward with its primal foundational model. Now, that said, and just a couple of things, you have before you, which I will return to this afternoon, my attempt to decode what this quadration is in the psyche based on a lot more evidence, uh, interdisciplinary evidence than Jung had. Uh, in a way that uh, you can plot, you can plot a lot of theories on this model. And you can plot a lot of classical Jungian concepts, including Tony Wolf and uh, so forth on this model. And, uh, and uh, uh, you can relate a lot of research, contemporary research, to this model. Uh, and uh, what we will do later, we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time doing it this weekend because what I'm just trying to show you this weekend is what I think is a new paradigm, uh, an integrative theoretical paradigm uh, that really pushes forward into a serious honoring of Jung's uh, genius without turning him into uh, a, a simply a cult leader. And uh, and uh, so we're going to talk about these, what I believe to be uh, how right Jung was. Uh, this afternoon, I'll talk about how right Jung was about the quadration in the psyche. Uh, I will try to give you an understanding about what these 
what these four four fullness is what what I believe they represent four different uh, lines of development in the psyche in the attempt to move toward creative integration and so uh, when I speak to you about integrative psychotherapy it's not an empty term uh, I, I think that our task as therapists and clinicians is to actually be aware of the enormity of these archetypal energies coming in through different doors in the temple of the, of the psyche and how those things have to be differentiated with a person. So I'll talk about how that reflects, relates to Freud's understanding about this. Uh, how, how, it, how it's got to be differentiated, then these energies have got to be brought into a good enough balance against each other or there will be chaotic, dysfunctional vibration in the, self, the little s self system. To the extent that there's not a dynamic balancing of these four energies in the psyche, there will be a lot of chaos. And it really matters how your personality is or organized and which of these energies is dominant. And we'll go into that. And then by tomorrow, I want to go into that in depth this afternoon, showing you some of the, some of the data, interdisciplinary data that uh, supports this model. I'll tell you a little bit about how I came to it, uh, stumbled into it. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, we're going to look at how you can think about the pathology in, in your clients, the structural deficits leading to their symptom pictures, uh, and the ways in which, the concrete ways in which they are compulsive. And then in the afternoon tomorrow, I'm going to give you the briefest of overviews about the, what I've come to believe to be the principles of how you help a person begin the task of integrating this incredibly complex thing and moving in the spiral toward creativity in their self-system integration. Individuation, think that, think individuation. Uh, that is to be able to creatively organize as much as possible in that person's self-system on an ongoing flow basis. So let me just say one final thing before we take our break. Uh, I'm going to suggest <clears throat> I'm going to suggest to you that every one of the people you see can come to an optimal level of creative integration in their little s self system if they get enough if they get adequate resources this does not mean that each person you see will come to the same level of creative integration because different people are facing different <coughs> constitutional givens, different histories, different actual constraints. But every person, I think that as a therapist, you should be imagining in your mind, based on all you know about them, you should be trying to imagine what the optimum for them might be. Because I guarantee you, if you start thinking about what their optimum might be if they really became an ally of yours, and they really became fierce with your help, what might they attain in the level of creative integration? And most therapists today do not think that way. They've been trained not to think that way. And so let's take our break now, and then uh, after, in our second lecture, I will take you into the plumbing in more, in more uh, detail and we'll proceed. And then tomorrow we'll get into the diagnostics based on the plumbing and the uh, therapeutic strategies based on the plumbing. podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. 
For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org.